So far in this series of lessons, we have considered two issues of distinction. The existence of God, which differentiates between atheists and ag agnostics, those who deny God's existence and those who question God's existence, from Buddhists, Hindus, Jews, Muslims, Christians, etc., who believe that there is a God. We also looked at the identity of God to see who that God is, which distinguishes between Buddhists, Hindus, etc., who say that there is uh, more than one God or that the God of the Bible is not the only God or not the true God, and those who, are, uh, who, who say the God of the Bible is the one true God. Our next issue of distinction concerns the identity of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, Jews and Muslims believe that he was just a good man, perhaps even a prophet. But that's where they stop. He was either a good man, maybe a prophet, but that's all he could possibly have been. Christians, on the other hand, profess much more. Christians believe that he was the Messiah, the Messiah spoken of in the Old Testament, the Messiah who was promised in the Old Testament, and in fact, that he is even the Son of God. So in our study tonight, I want us to briefly look at some of the claims made about Jesus and some evidence which supports those claims. So let's start by looking at some of the claims made about Jesus. This actually is where we normally will look at the importance of the issue, but the claims made are the import, is the importance of the issue, uh, as a matter of fact. The, because the New Testament makes bold claims about Jesus. Very bold claims, and very... Um, we might even say very impressive claims about Jesus. And so uh, we, we want to know, are they true? Well, what are some of the claims they made? Well, the New Testament presents Jesus to be the Messiah. The Messiah foretold by in the Old Testament. This is seen in the confession of Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> And also, it's seen in Luke's description of Jesus' conversation following his resurrection with the disciples on the road to Emmaus and how he began with the scriptures to, tell, to teach them the things that must take place about his resurrection and all. Luke 24, 25 through 27 and 44 through 48. But more than just presenting him to be the Messiah... The New Testament presents Jesus to be the Son of God. Again, Peter confesses this, Mark, uh, Matthew 16, verse 16. Jesus asks, who do people say I am? And they go through a long list of people. But what about you? Who do you say I am? And, G and Peter replies, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Introduced in John's Gospel, John chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of man. The Word, of course, being Jesus. Jesus was with God. Jesus is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. Those are some pretty bold claims. There's even something more bold, though, and that is that the New Testament allows only two alternatives concerning these bold claims about Jesus. Two alternatives, not three, there are two, okay? And those two alternatives are that Jesus is everything the New Testament authors claim, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, he is the Son of God. Indeed, that He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. 1 Timothy 6, 14-16. That's one alternative. That Jesus is everything the New Testament says He is. The other alternative is that the New Testament is a fraud. 
written purposefully to deceive people. The authors leave us no other choice. That's not something I came up with. This isn't something that, that, that some scholar or commentator or a professor in college uh, told me. The New Testament authors make this determination. Either Jesus is everything they say he is, or they are frauds. The New Testament is fraudulent, written to deceive. In 2 Peter 1, 16-18, Peter writes, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths, written uh, when, when we made, you, made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter says we are eyewitnesses of Jesus' majesty. So, either their story is true or they are false witnesses. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 through 16, Paul writes these words, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. So Paul's point here is that we have said that Jesus was raised from the dead. If that's not the case, because the dead are not raised, then we're lying to you. Okay? It's not me that says there's only two all, all options, two alternatives. The New Testament authors allow two alternatives. Either they're telling the truth or they're lying, plain and simple. Now, some might say, well, but, preacher, there's a third possibility. And that third possibility is that they really believed it to be true. They thought it was true, but it wasn't. They were simply mistaken. They were sincerely mistaken. I want to tell you a secret. We cannot say that they were sincerely deceived or sincerely mistaken, especially as it res relates to the resurrection of Jesus, that, uh, uh, which is offered as the uh, most highest, the ultimate proof that Jesus was uh, God in the flesh and of his Messiahship. Because, you see, they claim that after his resurrection, they ate and they drank with him. Acts chapter 10, verses 39 through 41. They claimed that they saw him and with their own hands they touched him. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. They leave no room for saying that they were mistaken or deceived. Not Carl, okay? Carl doesn't, isn't the one that leaves no room for them to have been sincerely mistaken. They themselves say, we can't possibly have been mistaken about this. We can't have been deceived. Now, some skeptics have tried to offer this as an alternative explanation. That perhaps in their grief, and their loss concerning the crucifixion uh, uh, of Jesus, that they hallucinated or they saw visions of Jesus, but it wasn't really Jesus. It was grief-induced hallucinations. And some people think that that sounds reasonable. However, hallucinations and visions are highly individualistic experiences. One person might have, a, have a, a hallucination or a vision, but you get two or three people together, and even if they have hallucinations and visions, it's not going to be the same thing. They're not going to hallucinate the same thing. They're not going to have a vision that is the same thing. Uh, they, they, they won't have it at the, see the same thing. They won't see it at the same time as outlined in the Gospels and also 1 Corinthians 15 verses 4 through 8 
The resurrection appearances of Jesus were often witnessed by many at the same time. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, 4 through 8 mentions an, occur an occurrence where over 500 people at one time saw Jesus after his crucifixion and after his resurrection. 500 people. 500 people are not going to have the same hallucination or the same vision. It's just not going to happen. So we really have no other choice. Either the New Testament with its claims about Jesus is a book of truth or it is a book of lies. Which is more reasonable to believe? To help us to decide, let's make uh, some observations concerning implications if claims about Jesus are not true. If we want to go with the approach that the Bible is fantasy, that it is a fairy tale, that it is fiction, what does that mean? What, is that, what, what are the implications of that? There are five that I can come up with. The first of those is that the New Testament is a carefully orchestrated lie if the claims made about Jesus are not true. Because you see, with great accuracy, the authors described events and places and people. And these are things that can be checked via archaeology. Luke 2, 1 through 5. Luke speaking uh, of that, it says he about the census made when Quinarius was governor uh, uh, in relation to the birth of Jesus and why Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem. Uh, you know, he, 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 it's a historical event that has been checked out by, by archaeology. If the record of miracles and the resurrection is false, then they carefully blended fact and fiction. That or they were such geniuses that they were able to somehow falsify what would later become the archaeological record of events. They knew that thousands of years later somebody would want to do a dig somewhere to see if what they said was true, so they planted evidence thousands of years in advance. That's what this says, okay? Uh, the, that the New Testament is a carefully orchestrated lie, lie. Is it reasonable to believe that? I don't think so. Second implication, if the claims made about Jesus are not true, is that the authors suffered extreme hardship for what they knew was a lie. Okay, again, they couldn't have been sincerely deceived. So... Tell me, those of you who have told a lie in your lifetime, okay, why did you tell a lie? Well, did you do it because you wanted to get into trouble? No. You tell lies to stay out of trouble, don't you? Well, that's the premise behind it. It very rarely works. Public service announcement to those of you under the age of 18 and over the age of 18 for that matter. But uh, it, you know, lies very rarely keep you out of trouble. Well, a lot of people will lie if they think they can get something out of it. Maybe they can get out of trouble. Maybe they can get power or perhaps money or, or what have you. They, they, they lie so that they can, they can gain something. But tell me, what did the apostles get out of it? Well, if you turn back in 1 Corinthians to chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 9 through 13, let's see what one apostle got out of his testimony. 1 Corinthians 4, 9 through 13. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles, last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we are in disrepute. <coughs> to, the present, to the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buff, 
uh, buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and still and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. What did the disciples, what did the apostles get out of their testimony? They got treated like dirt, okay? If you're going to tell a lie, you're not going to tell a lie that is going to cause you to be treated like the scum of the earth. And if telling that lie causes you to be treated that way, you're going to change your story. Because nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to be treated that way. What about Paul? I mean, he writes that in 1 Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 29, we find out exactly what Paul meant by being treated like the scum of the earth. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 29. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? So what did Paul get out of his testimony? He got his body abused in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. Yet he held to his testimony. If the claims made about Jesus are not true, then the authors, like Paul, suffered extreme hardship for what they knew was a lie. But how do we know, <coughs> excuse me, how do we know that they really suffered these hardships? I mean, hey, let's face it, if you're going to lie about a guy being raised from the dead, you could lie about what you had to deal with as a result of that story that you're telling. You can, uh, you know, pile on some more lies uh, in addition to that. So what, how do we know that they weren't actually lying about what they had to endure? Well, in one instance, the fact that the letters of the New Testament were even saved is a pretty good indication that they were telling the truth. Let me give you an example. And we've looked at th these books just a few minutes ago. First and Second Corinthians. Just two examples. First and Second Corinthians are letters that are filled with rebuke of the Corinthians. Uh, the Corinthians would have every reason not to save these letters which expose their faults. I mean, let's face it. If somebody is saying or writing, writing something to you and accusing you of things that uh, maybe you aren't doing or things that you are doing but that you don't really want publicized that you're doing it, what are you going to do to that letter or that writing? You're going to destroy it. You're going to, to make sure that nobody can ever read that letter again. The Corinthians would have every reason not to want to see these letters preserved and saved. Yet the Corinthians had first-hand knowledge as to whether the apostles and Paul really suffered the hardship spoken about in their letters. If they knew the accounts of such hardship to be false, they would have quickly destroyed these letters written by a liar who was just writing them to try to embarrass the Corinthians. And, and tell everybody about the Corinthians' problems. So especially when it comes to the author of about roughly half of the New Testament books, the Apostle Paul, he suffered extreme hardship for a lie if the New Testament 
is not true. Is it logical to assume that? I really don't think that it is. <clears throat> Third implication. If the claims made about Jesus are not true, the New Testament is a carefully orchestrated lie. The authors suffered extreme hardship for what they knew was a lie. And the authors who were martyred knew they were dying for a lie. So not only did some of the authors endure persecution, they had their lives taken from them and they knew that it was all for a lie. <clears throat> it's true that there have been many people in history who have died for what ultimately turned out to be a lie. They didn't think it was a lie. They sincerely believed it to be true, but they were mistaken. They were sincerely mistaken. And they paid with their lives for their mistake. But we have seen that the nature of the apostles' testimony as eyewitnesses of the resurrection does not allow for the possibility that they were sincerely mistaken. History and tradition records for us that James, the brother of Jesus, was stoned to death. Paul was beheaded. So on top of all the other stuff he had to endure and was forced uh, to, to deal with, his life was taken from him by having his head separated from his body. Peter, again, history and tradition tells us, was crucified. Except he didn't see himself as worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. And so at his re own request, he was crucified upside down on the cross. And yet, he did that, he made that request, knowing that it was all a big lie. Does that even remotely sound like it's possible? I don't think so. If the New Testament is a lie, then they went to their deaths knowing they were dying for a lie. Is it rational to believe that? And fourth, in suffering and dying for a lie, they went against everything Jesus and they themselves taught. Have you considered that? I mean, not only were they liars, they were hypocrites. I mean, because, you know, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, he says, simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. In other words, tell the truth. All the time, people need to know that you're telling the truth. And if they're lying in what they record for us, then they weren't practicing what Jesus taught them. And they weren't practicing what they taught others. Uh, Paul in Ephesians 5, 4 verse 25 says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Except for us, because we're going to lie to you, everyone. about No. And then Peter, 1 Peter 2, 2 verse 21. He, uh, excuse me. 1 Peter 2, verse 1. <laughs> so put away malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Does it make sense to believe that? So if the claims made about Jesus are not true, there are some implications. Number one implication is that uh, the New Testament is a carefully orchestrated lie. Number two is that the authors suffered extreme hardship for what they knew was a lie. Number three, those authors who were martyred, who died, went to their deaths knowing that they were dying for a lie. And... In suffering and dying for a lie, they went against everything that Jesus taught and everything that they themselves taught. And fi fifth and finally, the implication, if the claims made about Jesus are not true, then the book with the world's highest standard of morality and loftiest goals was written by liars, frauds, and deceivers. Think about that for a second. What book presents a higher standard of love and morality than the New Testament. 
And think about the things that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. I mean, you start with the Beatitudes, and they go completely counter to everything you would think. <coughs> Excuse me. They go completely counter to everything. And he says some, some things that are really weird, like love your enemies you know, and things of that nature. And, and, and yet, that was written by liars, frauds, and deceivers. What about Paul's essay, Discourse on Love, 1 Corinthians 13, and what love really is? Love is patient, love is kind, and so forth. How could a liar, fraud, or deceiver write such a thing? Can you believe that they would? I don't think so. Yet, this is what one must believe if they do not believe the New Testament when it speaks of the miracles, the fulfilled messianic prophecies, and resurrection accounts of Jesus. They must believe that it is a carefully orchestrated lie. They must believe the authors suffered extreme hardship for what they knew was a lie. They must believe that those authors who were martyred died knowing that they were dying for a lie. They must believe that in suffering and dying for a lie, they went against everything Jesus and they themselves taught. And that somehow these liars, frauds, deceivers, and hypocrites came up with a book containing the world's highest standard of morality and loftiest goals. How intelligent or logical does that sound? It goes against every bit of logic. I am convinced that those who do not believe the New Testament are those who either have never actually read the New Testament carefully or they are those who have not considered the logical implications of simply regarding it as a mixture of fact and fiction. But to those who will read it, those who will read it, I believe that they will find that it has the ring of truth to it and that it will convince one of the true identity of Jesus of Nazareth that he is exactly who the Bible says that he is. As John wrote toward the end of his gospel, in John 20, verses 30 and 31, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So what is your view of Jesus of Nazareth? Are you willing to accept the evidence that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? If so, then with such faith you have the right to become a child of God, John 1 verse 12, and to have life in His name, Galatians 3 verses 26 and 27. But you know that faith that you have that Jesus is the Son of God? It has to be coupled with obedience. Because if it's not, then it doesn't do you any good to believe that Jesus is the Son of God if you're not going to act on that belief. If you're not going to act on that belief the way that this book says to act on that belief. If you haven't acted on that belief yet by being immersed in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, why not do that tonight? Bring Christ your life as broken as it is and He can fix it. And He will fix it. Maybe you've made that first initial commitment. But since that time, you've sort of gotten a little bit wayward in your uh, activity. Maybe your life has been broken again. And you would like the prayers of the church to have, that, have your life put back together by Christ. Yet again, the invitation is yours. And there's no better time than right now to make things right between you and God. Maybe you need to re respond just privately where you're at. Whatever the need is, don't leave here still in need of making things right between you and God. 
If we can help you through a public response for baptism, prayer, or anything else, won't you come to the front now as we stand and sing together?